Dan Radio Style. Hope everybody out there is having themselves a great day. Another Neville Nugget, a goddard goody for sure. From Out of This World, it's chapter three. And there's only one more chapter after this, by the way. Such a great book. Very heavy into consciousness dreams and all sorts of really cool stuff. I'm loving where it goes. But the one thing that really jumps out at me in this particular chapter is the as man thinketh in his heart, that whole concept that we've all heard before, that has a lot of meaning. As what we think in our heart, as what we hold in our heart, not just about others, which for sure is part of that, and it does affect manifestation. What you hold in your heart about others, what you feel about man and your fellow man matters a great deal. He talks a lot about that in here for sure. But also the standpoint of what we hold as real when we do this consciousness work. I mean, it all comes down to getting our consciousness to the point of having the thing that we already desire. How do we do that? We imagine or kind of make believe. I like the term. I've been using it a bit lately. We kind of make believe that we have the thing already. We imagine it. We pretend. We give it life. We give it reality. And we kind of make it real. And then it starts to feel real. When it feels real, that's when your consciousness is actually at that level. And how you're feeling at that moment where it feels real is kind of like you need to kind of like when someone, you put them up against a wall and you mark how tall they are, you got to kind of set a little increment as to what that is. Like how you feel right now, that's how you need to feel all the time. 100% of the time, you feel like you have it already because you do. And when you create that feeling, the actual work is done. So that's why he says thy work is done or it's finished or whatever. It's finished, right? Because it is at that point, once you give it that level of reality. So that's what he's teaching us in this particular chapter, and he does it beautifully as always. So, chapter three. Men claim that a true judgment must conform to the external reality to which it relates. That means that if I, while imprisoned, suggest to myself that I am free and succeed in believing that I am free, it is true that I believe in my freedom, but it does not follow that I am free for I may be the victim of illusion. But, because of my own experiences, I have come to believe in so many strange things that I see little reason to doubt the truth of things that are beyond my experience. He's starting off this chapter acknowledging the fact that, you know what, I know people can say whatever they want to say, this is, doesn't work, it's a bunch of hooey, whatever. From my experiences, I've come to find that in most cases, it seems to work out exactly like this. And I'm the same way. Like, I've seen this happen way too many times in my life to at least not be sure this has something to do with it. May not be all of it. Might be like 70% of it, maybe. Maybe there's still a good chunk of this I'm trying to, you know, isolate, fine-tune. But Goddard continues. The ancient teachers warned us not to judge from appearances because, said they, the truth need not conform to the external reality to which it relates. They claimed that we bore false witness if we imagined evil against another, that no matter how real our belief appears to be, how truly it conforms to the external reality to which it relates. If it does not make free the one of whom we hold the belief, it is untrue and therefore a false judgment. Think about any time you think ill of anybody or wish that the third party something, I wish that they'd be unhappy, right? Like when we wish ill on others, that's not necessarily the best logical path forward. Maybe the third party finds somebody else and the other guy gets to find you and there's a happy ending for both. And that's a fun kind of reality to hold in your heart. But be careful what you think of others. Goddard continues. We are called upon to deny the evidence of our senses and to imagine as true of our neighbor that which make him free. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. To know the truth of our neighbor, we must assume that he is already that which he desires to be. Any concept we hold of another that is short of his fulfilled desire will not make him free, and therefore cannot be the truth. Instead of learning my craft in schools where attending courses and seminars is considered a substitute for self-acquired knowledge, my schooling was devoted almost exclusively to the power of imagination. I sat for hours imagining myself to be other than that which my reason and my senses dictated until the imagined states were vivid as reality, so, that, so vivid that passers-by became but a part of my imagination and acted as I would have them. By the power of imagination, my fantasy led theirs and dictated to them their behavior and the discourse they held together while I was identified with my imagined state. Man's imagination is the man himself, 
The world as imagination sees it is the real world, but it is our duty to imagine all that is lovely and good report. The Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh upon the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. This is key, true, true words on many, many levels. Goddard's given us some delicious goody there. That's like a big heaping, came out of a can of whipped cream kind of goodness. In meditation, the brain grows luminous. I find my imagination endowed with the magnetic powers to attract to me whatsoever I desire. Desire is the power imagination uses to fashion life about me as I fashion it within myself. I first desire to see certain persons or scene, and then I look as though I were seeing that which I want to see, and she imagines states becomes objectively real. I desire to hear, and then I listen as though I were hearing, and the imagined voice speaks that which I dictate as though it had initiated the message. I could give you many examples to prove my argument, to prove that these imagined states do become physical realities, but I know that my examples will awaken an all who have not met the like, or who are not inclined towards my arguments, a most natural incredulity. Nevertheless, experience has convinced me of the truth of the statement, He calleth those things that which be not as though they were. Romans 4.17 For I have, in intense meditation, called things that were not seen as though they were, and the unseen not only became seen, but eventually became physical realities. And what it sounds like here is he's giving an example of his experience with meditation, with manifestation, with the concept of thinking of something until you have it, and then actually seeing it come to fruition. Not only did I see it in my real mind, but I ended up seeing it in real life as well. By this method, first desiring and then imagining that we are experiencing that which we desire to experience, we can mold the future in harmony with our desire. But let us follow the advice of the prophet and think only the lovely and the good. For the imagination waits on us as indifferently and as swiftly when our nature is evil as when it is good. From us spring forth good and evil. And what he's telling us there is anytime we go into doubts, anytime we go into thinking some sort of disharmonious thought, that's instantly sent out as well. Subconscious doesn't care. Your manifesting portion of yourself just goes, okay, sure. Okay, sure. Okay, sure. It's 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 just an instant. Uh, take what you felt, what you've impressed upon it, and runs off. It doesn't care at all what it is. It just does it. It's just like a messenger almost, right? I have set before this day life and good, and death and evil. Desired and imagination are the enchanter's wand of fable, and they draw to themselves their own affinities. They break forth best when the mind is in a state akin to sleep. I have written with some care and detail the method I use to enter the dimensionally larger world. But I shall give one more formula for opening the door of the larger world. And to remind people, again, he's talking about the lullaby method, which I can link below, but it's the moment where when you get close to falling asleep and you get to that place where you can't really feel yourself, it's an amazing time to really start to impress your subconscious with your desires. I've been playing around a lot with this technique. Not only one, do I tend to wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and toss and turn thinking about problems with work and stuff like that, but I actually find that by using this technique, I can get myself back to thoughts that help benefit me towards my goals and actually help me go to sleep with a smile on my face and stops the tossing and turning of the little craziness that's going through my head. It's been really awesome for me to use that kind of concept. So again, kind of using that before you go to sleep feeling is an amazing time. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep calleth upon men in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instructions. In dream, we are usually the servant of our visions rather than its master. But the internal fantasy of dream can be turned into an external reality. In dream, as in meditation, we slip from this world into a dimensionally larger world. And I know that the forms in dream are not flat two-dimensional images with modern psychologists believe them to be. There are substantial realities of the dimensionally larger world, and I can lay hold of them. I have discovered that if I surprise myself dreaming, 
I can lay hold of an, any inanimate or stationary form of that dream, a chair, a table, a stairway, a tree, and command myself to awake. At the command to awake, while I firmly holding the object in the dream, I am pulling through myself with the distinct feeling of awakening from the dream. I awaken in another sphere holding the object of my dream to find that I am no longer the servant of my vision, but for its master. For I am fully conscious and in control of the movements of my attention. It is in this fully conscious state, when we are in control of the direction of thought, that we call things that are not seen as though they are. In this state, we call things by wishing and assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Unlike the world of three dimension, where there is an interval between our assumption and its fulfillment, in the dimensionally larger world, there is an immediate realization of our assumption. The external reality instantly mirrors our assumptions. Here there is no need to wait four months till harvest. We look again as though we saw, and lo and behold, the fields already white to harvest. Now he's kind of talking about how in dreams and where we're from and how the etheric place is this higher dimension 4d whatever you want to call it he's talked a lot of crazy awesome stuff in this book and out of this world specifically and he talks about how this different dimensionality right like when you're in that dream state and you think of things it's instant you're instantly there you instantly possess it and one of the things that kind of confuses a lot of us consciously is that we are very much used to being able to manifest more quickly than we can in this physical dimension and 3d it's like molasses in a fridge. It's super cold. And where we're from is very different and very fast. And so a lot of us are kind of like, why is it oh, so hard to get something to happen quickly? We're just very used to it. So he talks about how there's a little difference between physical life and dream life. But still, ultimately, when you pull something through, it ends up showing in your real life, your real physical life. It's fantastic how it works out. So in this dimensionally larger world, ye shall not need to fight. Set yourself, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. And because that greater world is slowly passing through our three-dimensional world, we can, by the power of imagination, mold our world in harmony with our desire. Look as though you saw. Listen as though you heard. Stretch forth your imaginary hand as though you touched. And your assumptions will harden into facts. Basically, pretend slash make believe really, really good. Use your eyes. Use your senses. Imagine you can smell the apple pie. It is amazingly powerful if you want to manifest an apple pie into your life. To those who believe that a true judgment must conform to the external reality, to that which it relates, this will be foolishness and a stumbling block. But I preach and practice the fixing and consciousness of that which man desires to realize. Experience convinces me that fixed attitude of mind which do not conform to the external reality to which they relate and are therefore called imaginary, things which are not will nevertheless bring to naught things which are. One of the things I found, and this is what he's talking about too, and he's done the same thing, and the one I like to use as an example, even though there are others, is radio. Going after the big job, trying to get that major job, just deciding that that's what I was going to do no matter what. That determination, that drive, the fact that I didn't care what anybody else said. And that's really what he's talking about here. Experience conv convinces me that fixed attitude of mind which do not conform to the external reality to which they relate and are therefore called imaginary. I kept seeing myself doing the job. I kept seeing myself at this big radio station. I kept seeing it. And while I was seeing it, I wasn't working at that station. I was working at small radio stations, like part-time and a full-time and all sorts of, but not anything significant. But I kept knowing that I was going to get there. And that is part of this whole process and journey is knowing, one, you already have it, and that's true. But two, knowing that it's coming, giving it that chance. It, the four months he's talking about to harvest, even though it's not going to be that long. But it's knowing that this process unfolds within real life. He continues. I do not wish to write a book of wonders, but rather to turn man's mind back to the one and only reality that the ancient teachers worshipped as God. All that was said of God was in reality said of man's consciousness, so we may say that, according as it is written, 
He that glorify, let him glory in his own consciousness. No man needs help to direct him in the application of the law of consciousness. I am is the self-definition of the absolute, the root out which everything prows. I am the vine. Now, I will say this is a big part of what I've been doing a lot of lately, is stating that I am all these different things that I know I am, and I know I need to be in order to become the desire that I have. So in order to be the thing that you are already, you must realize that you are that thing already. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to state that I am that thing already. I am successful. I am attractive to another person. I am the type of person that they wish to be with. I am their dream. I am their desire. You just need to be that which they want that which they claim they desire. And then we are again getting what we desire already. But being the thing that they're going to want and they're the thing that you want is what brings together a relationship or in the case of a job, being the right fit. What is your answer to the eternal question, who am I? Your answer determines the part you play in the world's drama. Your answer, that is, your concept of self, need not confirm to the external reality to which it relates. This great truth is revealed in the statement, Let the weak say, I am strong. And that's what you've got to do. You are the thing that you claim right now you lack. You already are it. You're already the thing that attracts that. You're already the consciousness which is that. You already have that. Look back over the good resolutions with which many past New Year's are encumbered. They lived a little while and then they died. Why? Because they were severed from their root. Assume that you are that which you want to be. Experience in imagination what you would experience in the flesh were you already that which you want to be. Remain faithful to your assumption so that you define yourself as that which you have assumed. Things have no life if they are severed from their roots. And our consciousness, our I amness, is the root of all that which springs in our world. If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. That is, if I do not believe that I am already that which I desire to be, then I remain as I am and die in my present concept of self. There is no power outside of the consciousness of man to resurrect and make alive that which man desires to experience. That man who is accustomed to call up at will whatever images he pleases will be, by virtue of power of his imagination, master of his fate. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Goddard does a beautiful job, again, illustrating the point that we have to realize we are the thing already. We have it already. All of his discussions talk about having the thing inside ourselves, experiencing it internally, and realizing by doing so, it becomes our external world. And that anybody that needs to be involved to make this reality possible will be involved. You don't need to worry about guiding each and every one of the marionettes of people, puppets, actors in our world. You just need to decide how is this world going to be, and the proper actors and actresses will get drawn in, will serve their parts, do their purposes, and move on and live their lives as well. And those that need to stick around and stay will find their homes in this new energy that we have now that our consciousness is where it is. Now that our consciousness realizes we've already got that which we desire. Now that our consciousness is what we are. And that's what creates the reality outside of ourselves. Being that thing that some people see as separate from themselves. I'd like to have more money. I'd like to have this individual. I'd like to have this new job. I'd like to have a new house. They see these things external from themselves. And that's not the reality from it. That's not the truth of it. So you've got to give these things a chance to unfold. Give these things a chance to become real in our life. And once they do, once you can get off your own feet, once you can stop slowing yourself down, once you can let these things happen and realize during the day, 
to feel like you've got it already, to be happy that you're experiencing it unfolding, to enjoy being alive and living in this world and being a part of your own movie. When we can see it is that way and enjoy the unfolding, every day, every step is like another magical day in the garden. It is. Enjoy the process and use Goddard's wonderful advice to help yourself see that you've already got this thing that you desire. Let it come to fruition. It's Dan Radio Style.